If I say it further, this submission of which we speak is really the humbling of self first before God and then to each other as members of the body of Christ. You see why it is now that we cannot humble ourselves before each other? Because we are not humble before God. So once you see hostility for each other, not only in the body here as here, but hostility between persons, it is sure evidence that a humbling of oneself, submitting of oneself, is not the experience of that person. I'll ask you a question, which is the obvious answer. Do you think the men of ISIS who cut people's throat and who do all that they do are submitted to God? I don't need to ask that question. It's an obvious answer, ain't it? Why do you think they do what they do? Because the hatred that in them is really against God. But you know, Jesus Christ has come and destroyed that and gives to us a reuniting with God. But only those who accept that being born again, being justified by faith, growing in grace, and having the defects cleansed on a daily basis are the ones in actual fact who are really preparing for the catechemic events ahead. Those are the only persons, you know. And sad to say, but true, you revolt at the thought of the men of ISIS. You revolt at the thought of the gay marriages. But let me tell you something. You are on the same play as them in rebellion against God if you are not in submission to God. Wow, that is shocking, huh? You mean that I like them people in truth and my attitude? It's just manifested in them that way, but it's manifested in me by anger and vexation and jealousy and, 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 and wickedness. Same spirit. So the reality is, you are a kindred brother, the ISIS and the gay people in spirit if we are not submitted to the very Spirit of God. I know it might be unpalatable to your mind, but sometimes unpalatable things have to be said to us that we may understand where the issues are. Imagine that I have the same spirit as any kind of people. You would say, me? I would never be gay. I would never cut anybody's throat in true. You would do anything but for the grace of God in you. And that's why, brethren, my heart pounds within me that we understand that our greatest need is the submission of our souls to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Or else we will be just like them when we are saying, oh, they are so bad. We will be just as bad, but in a different angle. Still just as bad. And I say now, as I begin to go into what I call high gear because of what is written in the latter half of this particular presentation. This submission of which we speak is really the humbling of self first before God and then to each other as members of the body of Christ. Let us consider with Andrew Murray in the chapter 3 of his book, Humility, him who is the essence of humility, yea, of submission. I want you to listen. If you haven't heard anything I've said before, I haven't said much really, but I want you not to get this and don't lose it on yourself at this time. So those who I see that, is, that the heat is affecting, just brace up yourself and hold for a few moments more. Follow me carefully. Luke twenty-two twenty-seven. I am in the midst of you as he that serves. You know who, who spoke those words? Christ himself. So Christ is the chief servant. You know, I, 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 as I thought of this earlier, you know, a servant has a tremendous privilege. You know, a servant serves his master and all his master's friends. And come in, especially if you are a servant, quote unquote, socially speaking now, of the upper class. You know, you come in contact with what you or human beings will call the bigots of the earth. There are servants who come in contact with the big shots that a lot of us who think that we're important, we can't even get interest into the um, company. So a servant at a certain level is top of the line. The queen has servants. And they interact with heads of state and so well, I'm speaking from a social perspective, and so-called big people. That you cannot even get a privilege and you think that you're important to get in people's company. 
by your servant, even serve and feed him. A servant is a tremendous office, brethren. And Christ has dignified it. And I like that. Christ has made the office of servant so dignified that it becomes a pleasure being a servant. And let's help see how Christ, quote unquote, pleasurized being a servant. Andrew Murray. In the Gospel of John, we have the inner life of our Lord laid open to us. Jesus speaks frequently of his relation to the Father, of the motives by which he is guided, of his consciousness of the power and spirit in which he acts. Though the word humble does not occur, we shall see nowhere in Scripture, we shall nowhere in Scripture see so clearly wherein his humility consisted. We have already said that this grace is in truth nothing but the simple consent of the creature to let God be all, in virtue of which it surrender itself to his working alone. In Jesus, we shall see how both as the Son of God in heaven and as man upon earth, he took the place of, an, of entire subordination and gave God the honor and the glory which is due to him. And what he taught so often was made true to himself. This is what he taught. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. As it is written, he humbled himself, therefore God highly exalted him. Listen to the words which our Lord speaks of his relation to the Father and how unceasingly he uses the words not and nothing of himself. The not I in which Paul expresses his relationship to Christ is the very spirit of what Christ says of his relation to the Father. And you should take much from what this brother is saying. And listen to Christ's words. The Son can do nothing of himself, John 5, 19. I can of my own self do nothing. My judgment is just because I seek not my own, John 5, 30. I receive not glory from men, John 5, 41. I am come not to do my will, John 6, 38. My teaching is not mine, John 7, 16. I am not come of myself, John 7, 28. I do nothing of myself, John 8, 28. I have not come of myself, but he sent me, John 8, 42. I seek not my own glory, John 8, 50. The words that I speak, I speak not from myself, John 14, 10. And the word which you hear is not mine, John 14, 24. Therefore, nothing that Christ did was really from Christ. And that is what is genuine submission. Father, to live within him and do everything in him, praise the Lord. And I want to say to us, brethren, this is the experience that God will have at this end of time in his people. That is, Christ will so dwell in us and keep out our sinful selves that the Father might fight against temptation on our account. So you see, brethren, it's not even you fighting against sin, but it's the Father in Christ who Christ keeps by us that fights against the temptation with our consent. That's what Paul means in, means in Philippians chapter 2, you know. It is God that works in you to will and to do. It is God who is doing the willing through you and the doing through you. And therefore, our glory and praise really go to God because it's God and not you, brethren. You see how the victory now is won? Or how we go to war fighting our own strength. Like David, who correctly had it. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and a shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Therefore, the Lord of hosts will I empower David to perform the works. And that's exactly what our experience has to be. We need to start, brethren, trying to do the work of God and allow God to do his work. That is where our problem lies. We like to do God's work and think we are doing God's work. We can't do God's work. Only God, brethren, can do his work. 
the words open to us, the deep, these words open to us the deepest roots of Christ's life and work. They tell us how it was that Almighty God was able to work his mighty, redemptive work through him. They show what Christ counted the state. They show what Christ counted the state of heart, which became him as the son of the father. They teach us what the essential nature and life is of that redemption which Christ accomplished now and communicates. It was completely the father and never Christ. Never. It is this. He was nothing that God might be all. Now, you, 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 you might not have well, you pick it up. But you know if you have a glass full of water, you can't have it full of orange juice at the same time. You have to displace water for the orange juice, brethren. What God wants is the displacement of self that he alone only is your life. Is that asking too much? It looks hard, doesn't it? You mean that I can't do nothing? Yes, you are to do nothing, but allow God to do in you his will and his pleasure. And we're going to express it. He's expressed it a little better there. I go again. He was nothing that God might be all. He resigned himself with his will and his powers entirely for the Father to work in him. Of his own power, his own will, and his own glory, of his whole mission with all his works and his teachings, of all this, he said, it is not I. I am nothing. I have given myself to the Father to work. I am nothing. The Father is all. This life of entire self-abnegation, of absolute submission and dependence upon the Father's will, Christ found to be one of perfect peace and joy, praise the Lord. That is the only way there is joy when God and God alone is your life. As you try to mix it up, you mess up things. God wants a free course in this in time, in his people, that he alone, that is why the word of God says, let your light so shine that God might be glorified, that men may see and glorify God, because really it is God who is shining. Alas, God honored his trust. Sorry, he lost by giving all to God. God honored his trust and did all for him and then exalted him to his own right hand in glory. And because Christ had thus humbled himself before God and God was ever before him, he found it possible to humble himself before men too. And to be the servant of all. That's the key. Once you are humble before God, it is not difficult to be humble before others. The humility before God counts and causes humility before men. His humility was simply the surrender of himself to God. To allow him to do in him what he pleased Whatever men around might say of him or do to him. Wow. Let me talk a little bit here because this is rubber touching the road. Imagine you are being castigated unfairly, unjustly. And you are not even defending yourself to let the people know that they are unfair in you. What do we say of such a person? He's a fool. You see in actual fact what it really is. Here was Christ, never once defending himself against accusation or even abuse. And even telling Pilate, you could have no power over me except it was given to you. Now listen, let me get real. Let's look at this thing in real modern language. Then a foolish man, as far as you're concerned, he had power to knock out Pilate and lick up all of them. And he plays stand there and meek and saying, you could have no power over me except it was given to you. Consider, therefore, then what God is about in contrast to human beings. You know if you had that power, and Pilate do that nonsense to you, know where he would be ready. He would be dead before he even start. You know that, believers, but not so with the life of God. You see why the enemy is at really a loss to have gotten Christ? Because he was so sold out to the Father that 
the prince of this world came and had nothing in him. And God's servant says, we too must be like that. You mean I got to be foolish according to what people will say? I must let people unfair me and don't say nothing? Oh, look at how humanity is in the face of Jesus, brethren. You have done only right. And they mash you up with all the lying lips. You have done only right. And they scandalize you and say other things about you that is not true. And you're going to sit back and take that. According to you, say in Barbadian parlance. I ain't taking that. Not me, boy. But let me tell you, brethren, that is evidence that you're not so look to Jesus Christ. Once that behavior becomes ours, it is evident we are not sold out to God in Christ Jesus for God to do everything he wants to do in us. And brethren, I know about me. And I pray daily for deliverance from that kind of attitude and that the attitude of God in Christ Jesus may become an experience totally lost or unbarred. Because this human flesh in which I'm cumbered with it's the same flesh that you have on that get on that same way. Believers, I believe that seeing these things about to come to dissolve, we ought to be the kind of people God wants us to be in Jesus Christ. So submitted to God that children, spouses, supervisors cannot write our spirits because God is in control, and is the life of our life. Would you want that experience, believers? It calls for a what Christ says, watching and praying that we don't fall into the temptation. But I go on and conclude because the heat is immense and sleep is telling on many people. It says, it is this state of mind in this spirit and disposition, that the redemption of Christ has its virtue and efficacy. It is to bring us to this, this, this disposition that we are made partakers of Christ. This is the true self-denial to which our Savior calls us. The acknowledgement that self has nothing good in it except as an empty vessel which God must fill and that its claim to be, do, to do, to be or do anything may not for a moment be allowed. Self-brethren is our problem. We hear that. The reason there is so much trouble in the church, because self is alive and kicking. Why do you think we fight against each other in the church? Because self is reigning kingpin. We be saying that is Jesus. What well, Jesus what? Jesus don't function that way. Jesus don't fight for position. Jesus don't fight for rights. He give up rights, brethren, that God might be honored. But no, we fight to keep rights that we might be elevated. Brethren, it is time that we understand it's about God and not about us. This is what the issues are. It doesn't matter who it is. These are what the issues are. It's about God and about no man whom you exalt or esteem highly. No, brethren, it is to be emptied of self and God alone. It is in this above and before everything in which the conformity to Christ consists, the being and doing nothing of ourselves that God may be all. Here we have the root and nature of true humility. It is because this is not understood or sought after that our humility is so superficial and so feeble. We must learn of Jesus how he is meek and lowly of heart. He teaches us where true humility takes its rise and finds its strength in the knowledge that it is God who works all in all, that our place is to yield to him in perfect resignation and dependence, in full consent to be and to do nothing of ourselves. Deep thought. This is the life of this is the life Christ came to reveal and to impart. A life to God that came through death to self and sin. If we feel that this life is too high for us and beyond our reach, it must but the more urge us to seek it in Him. 
it is the indwelling Christ who will live in us this life, meek and lowly. If you long for this, let us, meanwhile, meantime, above everything, seek the holy secret of the knowledge of the nature of God, as he every moment works all in all, the secret of which all nature and every creature, and above all, every child of God, is to be the witness that it is nothing but a vessel, a channel through which the living God can manifest the riches of his wisdom, power, and goodness, praise the Lord. So while we are being told here, you are a bare vessel for God to fill. But when you are full of self, or full of self, well, God can't do no filling. filling. If you have all self, how God could get in? Well, if a, a glass is full of water, the air cannot fill it any longer. So the water that has to be emptied to be filled by something else. Likewise, believers, except we are emptied of that self that we fight so hard to keep, God will not be able to fill us and manifest himself through us. That is where the issue is at. That is where our problem lies. We are full of self and thinking that we are honoring God. But it passes as a way of honoring God, though it is a way of forgetting him. I go to a paragraph over page because I need to cut it short. I see the need for shortening. Let's pick up your thought from the last sentence on the page three. It says, he never for a moment thought of seeking his honor or asserting his power to vindicate himself. That is something I emphasize. Imagine you are accused among your believers and you never seek to vindicate yourself. But we know that that is the opposite in our experience. We always seek to vindicate ourselves. Not me, I did not do that. He's a liar, it's him. That's not how Christ functions, you know. His whole spirit was that of a life yielded to God to work in. I want to stop there and go to our closing gem. Listen to it. His whole spirit was that of a life yielded to God to work in. Do you get the import of that statement? It's only as God work in your spirit that is yielded to him that you are really and truly the child of God, you know. This heart and cold function that we operate with, brethren, is just fooling ourselves. Just on and off, this little up and down. I ain't talking about the mistake of the man of God. I ain't talking about all wiggling up and down, to and fro, and still calling ourselves the child of God. We just fooling ourselves. It's just our experience, brethren. And oh, how God longs to change his believers. And he offers it to us in infinite plenitude. Just as believe it for it, brethren, and we shall have it. That's all he desires for us. Are we going to after today and continually, brethren, still function this kind of a way that is really us and not God, where we sin is God? No, brethren. No, no, no. We are fooling ourselves. That is what I call classic foolish virgin experience. Loving the things of God. Loving to be among the people of God. But don't have the spirit of God. I conclude with the text you started with. So does belonging to Christ help you in any way? Does his love comfort you at all? Do you share anything in common because of the Holy Spirit? I want to re reverber that in your mind. Do you share anything in common because of the Holy Spirit? Has Christ ever be gentle and loving towards you? If any of these things has happened to you, then agree with one another. If any of these things ever happen to you, then agree with one another. Stepping out, it says, don't do anything only to get ahead. 
Don't do it because you are proud. Instead, be humble. Value others more than yourself. Oh, that we could go into James chapter 4 and that. Value, esteem others better than yourself. That is a hallmark of the mind of Christ. Let us pray, believers. Our Father, your word has shown us clearly how Christ was able to conquer sin in the flesh. I have discovered, dear Lord, he was submitted to you. Himself was kept back. He kept back himself and allowed you, Father, to be the life of his life. And he has enjoined upon us, dear Father, that he will be in us and you will be in him for the purpose of he keeping back ourselves and you, Father, manifesting yourself against sin and bearing us off more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loves us. Oh, give us, dear Lord, thoughts. Cause us, dear Lord, to stop and think and consider and allow Christ to take over and to keep us under with our consent that you, Father, might manifest your righteous life to the praise and to the honor of your glory. We thank you for showing us so clearly, dear Lord, how we are victorious by the surrender of self that Christ keeps under and you, Father, fighting our battles for us every day. We thank you this day in Jesus' precious name. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength in our redeemer. May God bless you as you meditate on the very life of Christ. Thank you.